Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. My name is Frank Turk. Before I get started, let me ask you this. How many have heard me before, or this is your first time? Yes. How many of you are here this morning? How many don't respond to surveys? What percentage of young people who are brought up in a Christian church their entire lives walk away from the church once they leave the home? I hear 85. Do I hear any, any, anything else? 90. 90. Whoa. Do I hear 100? <laughs> Actually, surveys vary from 69 to like 93 percent. Probably the average is three out of every four walk away. Three out of every four young people walk away from the church once they leave the home. Now, there's a number of reasons for this, but one of the reasons is intellectually they don't know why Christianity is true. It's because we haven't told them it's true. Well, you've actually been told it's true. Last week, Pastor Roger gave you some good evidence that it is true. But most churches don't talk about this stuff. Most churches don't talk about what 1 Peter 3.15 tells us to do, and that is always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Now, I love giving answers. The gentleness and respect part is a problem for me because I'm originally from New Jersey. Okay? <laughs> We haven't lived up to the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Christians don't get brownie points for being stupid. We're supposed to know what we believe and why we believe it. And you know, it's not all that difficult to show why Christianity is true. If you just look at four questions. Four questions. And if you can answer these questions in the affirmative, Christianity is true beyond a reasonable doubt. In other words, if you answer yes to these four questions, you can be confident that Christianity is true. What are the four questions? Here are the four questions. music, isn't it? That is actually from our TV program, which is on every Wednesday night and Saturday night on DirecTV channel 378. How many people here have DirecTV? Okay, a few more than last time, but why not the rest of us? Friends, don't let friends watch cable. If you want to get out and have enough faith to be an atheist, you got to get DirecTV. Actually, that's not true. You see our website right there, crossexamined.org. If you go to that website, at those times, now on the West Coast here, that would be, what, 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. on Wednesday nights and 7 p.m. on Saturday nights. Go to your computer. You can watch the show live. And if you can't get the show live, you can get the DVDs off our website. We're also on radio every Saturday morning. That is podcasted, so you can listen to it anytime. If you go to iTunes and type in cross Examined, you'll find it. Or we actually have a new app now. Just search for it in the App Store, cross Examined, and all of the podcasts are on the app so you can listen to them anytime you want. And what we do is we present evidence for Christianity and we cross-examine ideas against it. Now, why are these the four questions? Truth, God, miracles, and the New Testament. Well, obviously, on the question of truth, if there is no truth or if it's just true for you but not for me or all truth is relative, then quite obviously the Bible can't be true. Of course, if there is no truth, then any book written by an atheist can't be true either, right? Now, tonight, at 6 o'clock, we're going to spend more time on the first three questions. Does truth exist? Does God exist? Are miracles possible? Let me just give you a real short little intro to it. If someone were to ever say to you, there is no truth, you should ask that person a question. What should the question be? Yeah, is that true, right? If somebody says there is no truth, you say, is that true? Is it true that there is no truth? Because if it's true that there is no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true. But it claims to be true. Relativism, ladies and gentlemen, is self-defeating. All these crazy statements you hear in our culture today, there is no truth, you got your truth, I got my truth, there are no absolutes, all truth is relative, you ought not judge. They're all self-defeating. By the way, if somebody says you ought not judge, what should you say to them? Then why are you judging me for judging? <laughs> See, we'll talk about it more tonight. Second question, does God exist? Obviously, the Bible can't be true if there is no God. Tonight, we're going to see three arguments that there really is a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent creator out there. I don't have time to go through all the details right now, but let me just give you the conclusion to one of the arguments. 
The evidence, the scientific and philosophical evidence shows that space, matter, and time had a beginning out of nothing. Once there was no space, once there was no time, once there was no matter, and then it all came into existence out of absolutely nothing. Now, if that's true, and all the evidence points to the fact that it is, the cause must be spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. And quite obviously powerful, too, to create the universe out of nothing. Now, when you think of a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful cause, who do you think of? It's exactly what we mean by God. Next question, are miracles possible? Obviously, the Bible can't be true if miracles are not possible. And a lot of people have trouble believing in resurrections in Jonah and Noah and all these different miracles out there. Because, well, I haven't seen miracles before, so how can, they, how can they really happen? But what is the greatest miracle in the Bible? Anyone? This is the interactive portion of the program. <laughs> resurrection. No, resurrection's easy. Virgin birth, easy. Yes, the greatest miracle in the Bible is the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If that verse is true, every other verse is at least possible, right? Well, we now have scientific evidence that the first verse of the Bible is true. So if the first verse of the Bible is true, maybe the other verses are true as well. You just can't rule it out before you look at the evidence. Now, have any other miracles occurred since the first one? And for that, we look at the New Testament documents and see if they're really telling us the truth. Or were they written down by religious people who are biased and made it up? Actually, the answer we're going to see a little bit this morning is the fact that, no, they didn't make it up. They actually told the truth. And as I say, we'll fill in some of the details tonight. Now, there's really no way, this is all based on our book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. There's no way I can cover all this, the amount of time we have here today. The book is 448 pages. Actually, I probably could cover it because I am originally from New Jersey, <laughs> which means I speak at 150 words a minute with Gus to 350. <laughs> if you can't keep up, not a problem. The book is available on the book table as well as a 12-part DVD set that goes through all this material, including PowerPoint and Q&A and all that. It's like seven hours long. You can break it up into 30 or 40 minute segments, do it with your small group, your home school, your Sunday school, your high school, whatever it is. There's also a curriculum you can get at our website. There are many other resources. And by the way, all the proceeds from the sale of the books and the DVDs will go to feed needy children. Mine. <laughs> okay, just so you know. I've got three sons. We're putting them all through college. In fact, um, I was in the Navy for many years. Uh, not, many, not many people will know this, but Navy stands for never again volunteer yourself. <laughs> Actually, I had a great time in the Navy, but when my sons were interested in getting involved in the military, they came to me. They said, Dad, what should we do? I said, well, look, if you want to fight, go Navy. If you want a nice life, go Air Force. <laughs> so they went Air Force. They went Air Force ROTC, University of South Carolina. We live in North Carolina, but all three sons went to South Carolina. One of them's still there. The oldest two went to Air Force ROTC. The oldest one is now an intelligence officer in Las Vegas with the guys that fly the drones. Do you know all the drones that are flown in the war zones are controlled from Las Vegas? Did you know that? And you thought there was no real-world application for Xbox. <laughs> there is. The second son just got his wings in the Air Force. He's going to be flying KC-10s out of Travis Air Force Base in California. He's excited about that. The third son is not in the Air Force, but he's in his final year of uh, college at South Carolina, which means my wife and I get a raise at the end of the year. And it also means that we've been empty nesters for about the past three years. Yeah, it took us a while to get used to that, actually. About ten minutes. <laughs> That's how long it took to change the locks. <laughs> Do we have any empty nesters in here? Yeah, you notice how clean the house stays when they're gone? I mean, we love our kids, but they're messy. Anyway, there's our website, crossexamine.org. There's a lot up on the website, videos, a whole bunch of stuff you can check out. So check that out. We're going to spend just a little bit of time here in point four. You guys ready to go? Oh, by the way, you're probably wondering, well, what about the Old Testament? Well, look, if the New Testament's reliable, you get the Old Testament thrown in. Why? Who's in the New Testament that can authenticate the Old Testament? Jesus. If Jesus really is God, as the New Testament documents claim he is, now that's a big if, but if he really is God, whatever God teaches is true. Jesus taught the entire Old Testament as the word of God, so if the New Testament's reliable, you get the Old Testament thrown in. There's a lot more in the book on this, but I'm just trying to give you the, the Cliff Notes version. Let's take a look at, is the New Testament true? I'm going to give you six lines of evidence that begin with the letter E that will help you remember why we think the New Testament writers actually told the truth. We're only going to look at two of these. I'll list six. First of all, we have early testimony. 
Secondly, we have eyewitness testimony. Thirdly, we have embarrassing testimony. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Number four, we have excruciating testimony. Number five, we have expected testimony. That deals with Old Testament prophecy. And number six, we have extra-biblical testimony, non-Christian writers who make brief references to Jesus and the apostles. Now, actually, the book has a chapter called The Top Ten Reasons We Know the New Testament Writers Told the Truth. This is only six of them, and we're only going to cover two of them, embarrassing and excruciating testimony. Let's dive in on embarrassing testimony, and you're probably wondering what that is. There's something historians use when they're trying to figure out whether a writer's telling the truth. It's called the principle of embarrassment. It goes like this. If there's something embarrassing to the author or authors, it's probably true. Why? Why would it be true? Yeah, why would you lie about it? You're not going to lie and make yourself look bad. In fact, let me ask you the question this way. How many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look good? Can I see your hands, please? Those of you who don't have your hands up, you're lying right now to try and make yourself look good, and it's not working. We're on to you. We know you're lying. How many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look bad? You don't lie to make yourself look bad. You might lie to make yourself look good. Well, it turns out the New Testament writers, and even the Old Testament writers, fill the pages with embarrassing details that they wouldn't have lied about. They wouldn't have made these things up. That's why we call this the duh factor. They would never do this if they're making it up. Notice the New Testament writers depict themselves as dim-witted. They fail to understand what Jesus is talking about. They travel with the guy three years, and they don't figure out his mission until after he's gone. Also, they are uncaring. They fall asleep on Jesus, not once, but twice. Stay up with me and pray. This is my greatest hour of need. We'll do it, Lord. Don't worry. <laughs> they make no effort to give Jesus a proper burial. Who buries Jesus? Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin. What's the Sanhedrin? Sanhedrin is the Jewish ruling council that sentenced Jesus to die. Now, why would they make... Joseph looked like a good guy while they ran away and hid for fear of the Jews. And why would they say that Jesus was in a Jewish tomb? What could the Jews have done if Jesus' dead body was in their own tomb and the Christians began claiming that he had risen from the dead? What could they have done to squash Christianity right away? Could have gone to their own tomb, taken the body out, and said, stop all this nonsense, talk about the resurrection. But they didn't do that. What did they do? They said the disciples came and stole the body while the guards were asleep. Now, that's a bad explanation for at least two reasons. Reason number one, if you're a Roman guard on duty and you fall asleep on watch, what happens to you? You're toast. Reason number two, if you're a Roman guard on duty and you fall asleep on watch, how do you know what happened? <laughs> we were asleep, see, and the, Roman, and the uh, disciples came and stole the body. You were asleep. Yeah, that's right. Well, how do you know what happened? Stop asking questions and just give us the bribe. It's also a bad explanation because... What motive would the disciples have to steal a body anyway? If it wasn't true, to get themselves beaten, tortured, and killed, that doesn't make any sense. We say, well, how do we even know that's the story? Well, it's in Matthew. Well, how do we know Matthew's telling the truth? Well, it's not just Matthew who tells us this. There is a 150-year period as Christianity begins where the Christians kept saying Jesus has risen from the dead and the Jews keep saying, no, the disciples came and stole the body while the guards were asleep. Now, when they say that explanation, what are they admitting? They're admitting the tomb's empty, right? You don't need to come up with a story for the empty tomb if he's still in there. They're admitting the tomb's empty. Also, notice they are rebuke. Peter, their leader, is called Satan by Jesus. Do you think they made this up? Do you think Mark just invented this? And he said, you know, Pete, I'm going to have the Lord call you Satan. <laughs> That'll make this story really fun. What do you think Peter would have said? Have him call you Satan. <laughs> Why is he calling me Satan? I'm their leader here. Also notice Paul rebukes Peter, two leaders now. Paul rebukes Peter for being wrong about a theological issue. He says, I told Peter to his face that he was wrong for trying to get these New Testament believers to obey the Old Testament law. Well, if they're just making all this up, why are they arguing over theology in the Bible? If they were making it up, they wouldn't be arguing. The reason they're arguing is because they're trying to get it right, even though it's embarrassing. Also, they are cowards. Peter, their leader, denies Christ three times after saying, I'll never deny you. And then the disciples run away. This is like a Monty Python movie. <laughs> run away. Oh, they all run away. And who are the brave ones? Ladies, who are the brave ones? The women. That's right. Woohoo! Yeah. I am woman, hear me roar over there. 
Didn't run away like you sissy pants men did. <laughs> now, who wrote this down? Men. Now, what man? It's going to say that he was hiding for fear of the Jews why the women went down and discovered the empty tomb. Would any man in here make that up? No way. No men would say it. I mean, if I was making up the story, I'd, I'd write something down like this. I'd say, let's see, we marched right down there and overpowered that elite Roman guard. Yeah, that sounds good. And then we saw Jesus who congratulated us on our great faith. And then we comforted the trembling women. Never say I was Mr. Sissy Pants. <laughs> By the way, why would they never say the women were the first witnesses in that culture? Because a woman's testimony was not considered on par with that of a man. So if you're making up the New Testament story, you'd only have the men be the first witnesses. But all four gospels say the women were, were the first witnesses, which is telling us what? Well, they really were. Because it would be embarrassing to admit this, but they say it anyway. In fact, one woman uh, after one of these sermons said, I know why Jesus appeared to the women first. I said, why? She said, because he wanted to get the story out. <laughs> I said, you know, that is an excellent point. I had not thought of that. Because ladies, when your man comes home from work, does he say much? No, there could have been a nuclear explosion at the plant. He's not going to tell you, right? Imagine Peter coming, coming home from work that's the Resurrection Sunday. His wife sees him. Hey, honey, end am at work? Nah. <laughs> same old, same old. I heard Jesus had risen from the dead just like he had predicted. Is it true? Oh, yeah, it is. Got anything to eat around here? You know, men don't say much. Also, notice they are doubters. Despite being taught several times that Jesus would rise from the dead, the disciples are doubtful when they hear of his resurrection. Not only... Are they doubtful when they hear of his resurrection? Some are even doubtful after they see him risen. Now, this is Matthew 28, 17. What happens in Matthew 28, 19? Does anyone know? That's the Great Commission, right? The great, this is a climactic event. Jesus is on the Mount of Olives giving them the Great Commission. And he says to them, go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. Notice he doesn't say make believers. He says, make disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And then he ascends to heaven. And as he does this, some are standing there going, you see that guy over there? Yeah. That guy over there is Jesus. Oh, no, it can't be Jesus. He was just killed the other day. I'm telling you, it's Jesus. It can't be. He was killed. I saw he was killed. It is. It can't be. The spear went in his side. Blood and water came out. He was dead. I'm telling you, it is. It can't be. It is. How do you know it is? The women told me. <laughs> They're not making this up. Also, notice there's even potentially embarrassing details in here about Jesus. Notice his own family thinks he's out of his mind. They want to seize him and take him home. You've heard people say, well, you know, the New Testament writers embellish Jesus to be God. Oh, really? Then why are they putting this kind of stuff in there? Also, He's deserted by many of his followers. In John chapter 6, he says, look, you want to follow me? You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And many of the disciples said, hey, we can't follow this guy anymore. This is a hard teaching. Hey, if I was there, I'd say the same thing. Eat flesh, drink blood? What are you, a cannibal? I'm not following you either. And who would have made that up? Eat flesh, drink blood. That is not a made-up doctrine. Also, he's not believed in by his own brothers. That's very embarrassing to have your family and brothers not believe in you. Although we do learn later that James, the half-brother of Jesus who wrote that little book called James in the New Testament, dies as a martyr for his brother in the city of Jerusalem in 62 AD. He's the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. The Sanhedrin throw him off the Temple Mount. They find him still alive when he hits the ground, so they bludgeon him to death. How do we know this? No New Testament document tells us this. You know what tells us this? Josephus, the Jewish historian, who lived from 37 A.D. to about 100 A.D., he was in Jerusalem at the time, in all probability. He tells us this. But when Jesus was on the earth prior to his resurrection, James did not think his own brother was God. Why is he dying 30 years later, saying he is God? 
1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 8 tells us. This is the oldest evidence for the resurrection in the entire Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 8. It's a creed. It goes all the way back to the event itself. And in there it says that Jesus appeared to James. I guess that convinced him, right? That his brother was God. But prior to that, he didn't think his own brother was God. How many people in here have a brother, by the way? How many people in here have a brother who thinks he's God? Yeah, you don't believe in him either, do you? Also, he's thought to be a deceiver. He turns off Jewish believers to the point that they want to stone him. In John chapter 8, he's talking to Jews who believed in him. He gets to the point in the conversation where he says, look, if you believe in Abraham, you ought to believe in me because I knew Abraham. And they said, what? You're not even 50 years old. How could you know Abraham? And he said, before Abraham was born, I am. And they immediately picked up stones to stone him. Why did they pick up stones to stone him? What is all this I am business? Who is he quoting from? He's quoting from Exodus 3.14, the burning bush. You remember when God appeared to Charlton Heston? <laughs> Moses says to God, who should I tell the Israelites you are? And God says, tell the Israelites I am send you. What does I am mean? I am means the self-existent eternal one. The being that didn't have a beginning and won't have an end. The being that is the ground of all other being. The being that just is. Tell them that's who sends you. Jesus is claiming to be that being. He's claiming to be Yahweh, the Old Testament. That's why they picked up stones to stone him. They knew exactly what he was, who he was claiming to be. You know, it amazes me today. There are people out there who say Jesus never claimed to be God. Like Jehovah's Witnesses. When they come to my door, I go, come on in. <laughs> Want something to drink? <laughs> Sit down. They get the watchtower material out. I said, hey, before we get to the watchtower, can I just ask you a couple of questions? Sure. In fact, this first question I ask all unbelievers. The question is this. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? You'd be amazed how many people hesitate or say no. You know why? Because it's not here for many people. It's here. They don't want it to be true. They don't want to give up something they don't want to give up. So ask people that question. That's a good question to ask. Second question is, if Jesus never claimed to be God, then why did they kill him? Why did he get killed? for skipping around saying, love your neighbor? Does that get you killed? No, I don't think so. You get killed because claiming to be God to the Jews was blasphemy, and claiming to be God to the Romans was sedition. That's why he was killed. He didn't get killed for just skipping around saying, love your neighbor and bless those who persecute you. He was killed precisely because he did claim to be God. Also notice he's called a madman. He's called a drunkard. He's called demon-possessed. That's real flattering. You think they put that in there and made it up? He has his feet wiped with the hair of a prostitute, which easily could have been seen as a sexual advance. And oh, by the way, you notice there are two prostitutes in Jesus' bloodline. Who are they? Rahab and Tamar. Do you think Matthew and Luke said, you know what? I think we need to spice up the Messiah's bloodline a little bit. Let's put a couple of prostitutes in there. No. No. In fact, you know, when one of the writers gets to Bathsheba, he doesn't even say her name. What does he say? He says, Uriah's wife. He won't even say her name, but he put her in there, even though it's embarrassing. So in the Messiah's bloodline, you've got two prostitutes and adulterer. And then, of course, you've got David, who's a murderer and adulterer. You don't find this kind of embarrassing stuff in other histories, like, for example, the Egyptians. You're not going to find embarrassing details about the pharaoh in there because the historian for the pharaoh would have his head chopped off for saying anything embarrassing about the pharaoh. Both the Old and New Testament writers put all the warts and blemishes and sins of their supposed heroes right in the text. Why? Because they're just telling the truth. Also, he's crucified despite the fact that anyone who's hung on a tree is under God's curse. If you're making up a Messiah to the Jews, you don't hang them on a tree. Why? Because to the Jews, that's a curse. Well, Jesus was under God's curse. What curse? The curse of sin we all put him under. But if they were making this up, they wouldn't say this. There's more in the book on embarrassing testimony. Let's just spend a few minutes on excruciating testimony. Excruciating means out of the crucifixion. That's where we get the word from. And this is the argument that says these people who are in a position to know whether Jesus had risen from the dead or not died excruciating deaths when they could have saved themselves by saying he hadn't risen from the dead. This obviously is a painting of Peter being crucified upside down. Before we uh, look at that, 
Let's just take a look at the apostles' beliefs and practices before and after the resurrection. Remember, the early Christians were all Jews, with the exception of Luke. Everybody else is a Jew. And before, they believed in animal sacrifice. They had been slaying lambs for thousands of years, at least 1,500, 2,000 years. And then suddenly, Jesus comes along and they say, Christ's sacrifice is enough. You know all these lambs we've been slaying at the temple? We don't need to do that anymore because here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All these lambs prior to this were all symbols of the real one. Here's the real one. We don't need that anymore. Before they believed in a binding law of Moses, afterwards they said Christ has fulfilled the binding law of Moses. We don't need to worry about the law anymore. Before they believed in strict monotheism, afterwards they believed in a trinity. Three persons in one divine essence. Yes, I know the Trinity is hinted at in the Old Testament, but it's much clearer in the New. Before they, they believed in the Sabbath, in fact, they thought they could be stoned for not obeying the Sabbath. Afterwards, they're worshiping on Sunday. Why? Because that's the day he rose, even though it's a work day in their culture at the time. In fact, I was reading this morning in Colossians, Paul says, don't let anyone tell you that you have to obey any particular holy day or Sabbath day. They got rid of all that when Jesus came. Before they believed in a conquering Messiah, afterwards a sacrificial Messiah. Before they believed in circumcision, afterwards they believed in baptism and communion. Now, what would have caused these pious Jews who thought they were God's chosen people? Remember, they had this 2,000 plus year old relationship with the God of the universe. They thought they were God's chosen people. What would have caused them to abandon everything on the left for everything on the right virtually overnight? But the only thing I can think of is what psychologists call an impact event. What's an impact event? An impact event is something that impacts you so dramatically that it can cause you to change your perspective dramatically immediately. Some impact events are so impactful, you'll remember everything about the event till the day you die. You might not remember what you had for breakfast this morning, but you'll remember an impact event that occurred 50 years ago if you're old enough. In fact, only some of you will be able to answer this question, but I'll ask it anyway. If you can remember where you were November 22nd, 1963, raise your hand, please, and hold it up. Hold it up. The rest of you, look around these people with their hands up. You see these people? These people are very old. <laughs> November 22nd, 1963 is my earliest memory. I was two years old in two days. Yes, I'm 51 years old. I know I don't look a day over 50. My wife was very encouraging when I turned 50, though. She said, honey, you're going to live to 100. I said, how do you know? She said, because you look half dead already. <laughs> anyway, I'm standing in the living room at two years old in two days. I'm a toddler. And my mother is sitting on, the, on an ottoman in the living room in front of the TV, weeping uncontrollably. Mommy, what's the matter? What's the matter? They killed the president. They killed the president. President Kennedy assassinated that day. I can still see her in my mind right now when she was 26 years old. She's 75 today. But I can see her right now when she was 26 sobbing. That's almost 49 years ago. Why do I remember that? It's an impact event. That's, that's, that's as far back as I go in memory. I don't remember anything prior to that. Where were you when the second plane hit the tower? You knew where you were. As soon as you heard about 9-11, you know where you were, right? I was on the phone. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. I was on the phone to a pastor in Charlotte. He wanted me to come speak at his church, and we were talking about the topic. I had the TV on behind me. I had seen the first tower had been hit, but I was talking to this guy on the phone. I said, you got the TV on? He goes, yeah, something's going on in New York. I said, hey, maybe a Cessna hit the World Trade Tower or something. And Suddenly, he screams into the phone. He said, another plane just hit the second tower. I turn around. I look at the TV. The second tower's on fire. I said, you saw that? He goes, I go, was it, what kind of plane? Was it a Cessna? He goes, no, 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 it wasn't a Cessna. It was a big plane. It was a United plane. It was a passenger plane. It went right into the tower and exploded. I just saw it. It was right on TV. I said, let me call you back. I hung up the phone. For some reason that morning I had CNN on, the communist news network. <laughs> and I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up, but the commentator on CNN said, one has to think there's some sort of navigational error here. I said, navigational error? You dimwit. This is the clearest day in the history of the Big Apple. Do you think Stevie Wonder's flying these planes? 
This is terrorism. I called the pastor the next day. I called him back. I said, we're going to come to your church and talk about Islam because that's what this is related to. Now, 9-11 was just over 12 years ago. And those of you old enough can remember where you were and what you were doing. But if I were to ask you where you were August 11th, 2013, which was about a month ago, there's not a person in here that could tell me. Why? No impact event that day. Do you think if Jesus really rose from the dead, it would have been an impact event? Do you think the disciples would have remembered everything Jesus was saying and everything Jesus was doing till the day they died? And everything they were saying and everything they were doing till the day they... Of course! Guy rises from the dead, they're going to remember it. That's about the only way I could figure out why they would have abandoned everything on the left for everything on the right virtually overnight. Now, some people say, oh, they just made it up. Let me ask a question for people who say that. What did the New Testament writers have to gain by making up a new religion? What did they have to gain by saying that Christianity was true? Remember, they were Jews anyway. Well, first thing is they got excommunicated from the synagogue. Then they got beaten, tortured, and killed. Last time I checked, that was not a list of perks, right? <laughs> We're going to start a new religion. We are? Yeah. What's it going to get us? Well, first it'll get us excommunicated. Then we'll get beaten, tortured, and killed. Well, sign me up. <laughs> what a great idea. Why haven't we thought of this before? In fact, a friend of mine who's a cold case homicide detective in California, his name is Jay Warner Wallace, he just wrote a book called Cold Case Christianity. And he points out there's only three motivations for any kind of conspiracy. One is power, another is money, and another is a relationship or sex. Those three things. And if you look at... The New Testament, none of those were factors. They didn't get power, they didn't get sex, and they didn't get money for saying any of this was true. Yet they went to their deaths anyway. In fact, they had every motive to say the resurrection did not happen, not every motive to say it did. Now, I get questions, maybe you get questions. People will say, well, are there any non-Christian sources with regard to all this all these happenings in the first century. Well, yeah, there are a few, but you know what? You know what the question assumes? The question assumes that you can't trust the people that wrote this down because these people were biased. That is the most ridiculous objection if you think about it for half a minute. Why? What motive did they have to write this down if it wasn't true? Remember, they got excommunicated, beaten, tortured, and killed. They had no motive to write this down. They had every motive to say it wasn't true, not every motive to say it was. In fact, why would they die for a known lie? You're probably thinking, well, Frank, wait, wait. Are you, are you telling us that martyrdom proves Christianity? If that's the case, you just got done talking about 9-11. Islam has martyrs. In fact, Islam doesn't even believe Jesus died and rose from the dead. In Surah 4, verse 157, the fourth chapter of the Quran, it says Jesus never even died, much less rose from the dead. Yet, Muslims and Christians have martyrs. So isn't it a wash here? No, it's not a wash. Why? There's a number of differences between the Muslim martyrs of today and the New Testament martyrs of New Testament times. And let me give you one main difference here. The Muslim martyrs don't have evidence that Islam is true, or not good evidence anyway. They don't know they're going to get the 72 virgins if they fly a plane into a building. But the New Testament martyrs of New Testament times were in a position to know whether Jesus had risen from the dead. They saw Jesus. They touched Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They verified with their own senses he had risen from the dead. You see, many people will die for a lie they think is the truth. Nobody will die for a lie they know is a lie. And the New Testament writers were in a position to know whether it was a lie or not, and they went to their deaths anyway. You can't get better evidence than that unless you were there yourself. So... Let's sum this up for the New Testament. There's early eyewitness, embarrassing, excruciating, expect an extra biblical testimony. We can get into this a little bit later tonight, but we've got to uh, end here. It's fact, not fiction with regard to the New Testament. If it says Jesus said it, then Jesus really said it. If he says he did it, then he really did it. The overall argument, which we'll spend time on tonight, is does truth exist? The answer is yes. Of course, does God exist? Yes, are miracles possible? Yeah, the greatest ones already occurred. The question is, have any others occurred to verify Jesus being God? And that's what the New Testament helps us do. The answer there is yes as well. So for more, come tonight at 6 p.m. We'll have time for Q&A. In fact, I normally do Q&A, but I think tonight I'll just do Q. Okay? You ask questions, and then I'll move on to the next question. Now, no, we'll, we'll do, we'll do Q&A tonight, so if you come... Also, don't forget the book and the DVDs. There's only 112 more shopping days till Christmas. Makes a great gift, okay? Also, we have a new app I mentioned earlier. 
the app, which you can get at the App Store, just search for cross-examined, two words, or you can go to uh, our website, it has it there. The app not only has all our podcasts, but a very unique section called a quick answer section. Let's suppose you're in a conversation with somebody and they say something that, you, that against Christianity and you go, I don't think that's right. You go to the quick answer section right there on your phone or your droid or your, your iPad and it probably has an answer to that question right there. So you don't need to memorize all this stuff, you carry it with you wherever you have your phone, okay? Get the app if you would. Also, uh, if you sign up for our email on this little card here, you give us your email address and you keep this little, uh, this little bookmark, we'll send you one email a month with a good article that'll help you defend your faith. We don't give your email address to anyone else. We're also on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, like everyone else is. In fact, we are so into social media, we've combined YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook into one social media platform. We call it YouTwitface. Okay? So you may want to sign up for that as well. We're on radio and we're also on TV, don't forget about that. Okay, now the key question here as we wrap this up is, so what? You know, it's true, but so what? What does it mean? What, what, what should Christianity mean to us or to anyone? Well, in order to answer that, we've got to answer the question, why did Jesus come? And he actually tells us why he came. He says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, many people are thinking, ransom? I don't need anybody to pay God a ransom to get me off the hook because I'm a pretty good person. You know, I don't need anybody to pay God off. I can make it to God on my own. I'm a pretty good person. You know why we think that? Because we have a relative moral standard in our mind. From the moral giant Mother Teresa, who helped the poor her whole, her whole life, down to the moral midget Hitler. And next to Hitler, we put criminals. We know they're not quite as bad as Hitler, but they're bad. Then next to criminals, we put all the immoral people that we all know. You know our immoral friends and relatives who aren't quite as good as we are because our picture's right here next to Mother Teresa. <laughs> and then if we believe in heaven and hell at all, we arbitrarily draw a line in the sand and we say, these are the bad people, they're going to hell, and we're the good people, we're going to heaven. In other words, we compare ourselves to one another. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, that's not good, that's not wise for you to compare yourselves to one another. The standard isn't you against other people. The moral line does not run up and down between people. The moral line is God's perfect moral standard. It runs across the top. And all of us have fallen short of that line. From Hitler to Mother Teresa and everyone in between. And what Christ has done is he's come and lived the perfect life in our place. And by putting your trust in him, the right word is trust, not faith. Faith sounds like you don't have any evidence. It's trust. After you know it's true, you trust in him. But by putting your trust in him, you are forgiven of your sins, and then you are given his righteousness. Now, that's amazing when you think about it. You're not just forgiven, you're given his righteousness. So when God sees you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. However, this was not done inexpensively. You were bought at a price. A brutal price. The purpose of his life was to be punished in your place. His life was a gift to you. Have you received his gift? If not, why not? It is free. If you have received his gift, does anyone know it? Or are you an undercover Christian? If they were to drag you into a courtroom like they do in Pakistan right now and try and convict you of being a Christian, would you be convicted or would you be acquitted? If you'd be acquitted, you might want to reconsider how you're living. The least we can do for him after what he's gone through for us is to let other people know we stand with him. And what he went through here paled in comparison to the judicial separation he had from the Father. The pain was one thing. The separation from God was another. Paul says that God is making his appeal through us, through you, which means everything you do every day has an eternal impact, either positive or negative. Can Christ make his appeal through you? You have an opportunity to either accept Christ or, if you already have, further your commitment to him today.